I woke up one morning to this Facebook message to, to my to the account which I'd re um, activated again, saying, "Don't go near your granny's house, uh, Trisha, or you'll watch your newborn get raped." And it was signed off in the neo Nazi, in the name of a neo Nazi group called Combat Eighteen, which in the past has had links to loyalist paramilitaries. So um, it was just, I remember my son, he was only a few months old. I was just, I said, no, that's it. I'm going to the police now. I, I, I actually, this has crossed the line for me. So I did. And in between all of that, the death threats were coming thick and fast. Police coming to your door. Um, uh, there's an imminent attack going to be carried out against you by criminal elements. Um, one of them was that it was going to be shot dead within 48 hours at a specified location. Another one, and this was from the police. This wasn't just somebody writing this on the internet. It was coming from police intelligence. Um, and the, I think the other one was that it would be um, entrapped by being asked to go do a story and uh, I would be attacked. And uh, my, my car, there was another threat to attack me when I was in a certain loyalist area and East Belfast that my car would be attacked. I think you have to stand your ground. And um, and I do, I honestly do believe those people who, who came to me and did stories, they have made a difference. There is, there is, there's been a huge difference made. Um, there's a lot of pressure on certain paramilitaries now to transition from being paramilitaries into something else and to moving away. I do think, I just, I do believe it, 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 it is we need people to speak out and we need journalists who are willing to give them a platform and if we <laughs> we'll end up like Russia if if we if we you know just move away. So no I'm happy here. My children are happy here. So you know why should I leave? podcast if you're watching youtube please like subscribe and click the notifications bell so don't miss any future videos and updates if you're listening audio only on podbean or spotify please click follow and please check out my blog and channel pitch spotting with podrick some great vlogs have been done recently including manchester derby and a couple of cork city games and loads more to come so please check out that channel as well this week i'm delighted to be joined by an award-winning journalist patricia devlin Based in Northern Ireland, she specialises in investigative journalism and giving victims of crime, corruption and abuse a voice. She's also the first lady guest on the Parallel of Padre podcast, not by design, but uh, it's, I'm delighted to have her on. She's a woman that I have immense admiration and respect for with the challenges she's faced. And she's come on today to have a chat about her journey. I also had the pleasure of co-hosting an episode of Steve Rate's podcast, News of the World, that Patricia co-hosts every week recently. So it's been great to get, get, get to know you, Patricia. And thank you very much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much, Padraig. It's a pleasure to get on. And yeah, it was great doing that episode with you, Steve and Lee. It was, it was really, I was glad to have the Irish back up. <laughs> yeah, just devil the score a bit. And it's going to act today. We're filming this on Patrick's Day, both of our, our feast days. So yep, two, two yep. cats, a Padraig and a Padraigine. So that's a... Uh, yep. Good. Look, I've, got, I've even got a Guinness here that I'm going to attempt to drink. I don't even like it. <laughs> we go so, cheers and good health. Happy Paddy's Day. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. You're doing well to finish that, I'd say. I'm not a um, fan of Guinness, though, I have to say. It's good for the iron, apparently. I was just saying to Lee the other day, you wouldn't think we were from the same continent, not to mind the same island with her <laughs> range of accents. Like, you know, it's just funny for a small yeah. island, we have different, a different range of accents. Like even um, where I'm, like up north, like the, the different dialects, even in a small, like 
you know, distance. I think there's there's quite a few where I live. I live in South Derry, so there's different versions of the South Derry accent. Like you can even tell what village people are from. Like yeah. it's crazy. Where are you from, Project? I'm from Limerick originally, but um, I've lived in Cork for the last 15 years or so, so an honorary Cork yeah. Owen at this stage, yeah. You've got, you've, you can tell, like, there's a mixture in your 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 voice, your accent. There's yeah. a little bit of Limerick, a little bit of Cork. Yeah, but it's funny even just saying that there, like, even going to school when I was younger, you'd go into school six miles away from local village where I was living, and the accents are completely different with the people who grew up in the town, you know, so... It's funny how the accents. Yeah, yeah. I diverse. think somebody did. I think somebody did research on particular, in particular, sorry, Northern Ireland. There's, I think it has most like dialects than anywhere else. Like it's, it's bizarre. I don't know how it happened really, but there you go. I'd imagine there'd be a bit of that speaking in code as well, which we'll, <laughs> we'll, which we'll get, get into. To, yeah. We'll get to. Um, so I suppose just going back to the, the very start. Where you Patricia was you grew up at the height of the troubles really when you were very young yeah. in County Derry and Bally McGuigan yeah um, what was it like growing up for you uh so I, I grew up in like you say a little place called Bally McGuigan uh it's uh bordering Tyrone it also borders County Antrim and it's I mean I'm closer to Belfast than I am Derry uh weirdly enough um, it's a lovely wee place, a wee village, lived out in the country, went to a, a, a tiny primary school. Uh, just during the Troubles, the, you know, there you would hear of people being killed. I mean, there was um, someone we know uh, who was who was murdered in cold blood. UVF gunmen burst into the house and murdered him. Um, and that he was an innocent man. He was basically targeted because he was a Catholic. So you had that kind of fear when you were growing up that um, I remember my my mum worked in a Protestant school and I had that fear that she would be, you know, killed just because the, the, the naked sectarian killings. And, and I remember the first bomb that I remember was in Macrafelt, which is a big town where beside where I live and um, going into the the town the next day with my granny and stand behind the you know, police barricades and just everything had been decimated in most of the centre of the town. It was an IRA bomb. And so you kind of, but that was like, it wasn't shocking or it wasn't, you know, you didn't, I didn't think it was traumatised by it at all. It was just the norm and you've seen it in the news. We had the news on all the time in the house and, um, and then you would have the British Army uh, I remember five years old and there was a, there's a big field behind our house and I, you'd be running about in the field and you'd stumble across a British a British army man with a gun just lying down and, the, and it was just normal and you, you would see the troops um, marching down the street and and everything and it was just um but I would say my my childhood was relatively normal and I went to a lovely primary school and I went to a grammar school and and then it's only when you look back now that you realise that that's you know it was weird, it was wrong. You were living in a, a troubled place, but um, and I love the place where I'm from. I, you know, I don't live there anymore, but it's somewhere I, I just would love to go back to. My family still live there, and as you know, Eamon Coleman, the the 1993 Dairy Manager, he he's from there as well, and he was like a legend. When uh, when uh, when Derry won the All Ireland in nineteen ninety three, it's the last time they won it. We keep on thinking that we're going to get a chance again, but no. The one and only so far. Mm. I had Teddy McCarthy on the podcast who actually played in that final for Cork. It was one of his best days in in the Cork jersey. But it's funny. I watched that game back. My dad had it recorded Derry in Cork and. I enjoyed watching that game back. It was a very good Derry team. Um, I think they underachieved as well. I think they could have won another couple of All-Irelands. There's some great players like the Downies, Joe Raleigh, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, Anthony Tohill. It's just a pity yeah. that they didn't. Um, yeah. They won a good few National Leagues. They won, I think they won a couple of National Leagues after, but they're, mm-hmm. they're similar to Armagh, I think, in later years that they probably could have won another one or two to cement their status. But 
I love the jerseys, Sparrow Metal, and I loved Henry mm-hmm. Doney's speech as well. Yep, the Sam well. Maguire came into our primary school. It went everywhere. And I remember the day they won it because um, just every the they cavalcade the cars and the dairy flags, and it was just amazing. Like it really was, it brought everybody together. And during uh, 1993, you have to remember, it was a really, really dark period as well during the Troubles because there was the Shankill bombing, there was the Grey Steel in County Derry, which was, I mean, the trick or treat massacre, they call it, when EFF gunmen. Um, I think that was a month after, actually, the yeah. actually. It was just, just yes, yeah, so that sort of, you know, being able to come together and celebrate, that was just amazing. Eamon Coleman, God rest his soul, he's passed away since, but he always seemed like a character who who didn't suffer a fool's kind of stray talker, like, you know, so I'd say he was a, a good character in the local area. It, yeah, he was lovely, very humble, it, you know, it, it, he, you, you kind of think back then, he, he, he was seen as like a celebrity nearly. Everybody looked up to him because he was, you know, this manager and he brought the Sam to, to County Derry and all. But he, I remember Eamon, Eamon kept horses in the field next to our house and he'd just go in to look after the horses. There was no, you know, airs and graces about him. He was he was lovely and very normal and uh, real. he was passionate about football and he was passionate about the players. So, you know, and I, I'm sure he's very much missed. You have a connection as well with the Tyrone team, isn't that right? You have yes. Right. My my granddad played for Tyrone just for a year in 1964, and then he moved off to Manchester to work. So he's a big, massive Tyrone supporter. And I, I'll be honest, I support Tyrone too because he supports them. And actually, most of our family who live in South Derry support Tyrone because he's from. Arbo and uh that's where he and he's just I mean he's just football mad I think he went and put a bet on there yesterday and he's not a betting man but he would only bet on on uh on a, on the Gaelic football so he, he's a big list of teams that I that are going to get through the championship but he does know his stuff like he does win the odd team but I so um Tyrone would be my team which I get a lot of stick for because uh um I'm from South Derry. It doesn't go down too well. <laughs> you mentioned there about the trick and treat massacre. It just reminded me, um, just after that, I think it was November 93, Ireland, the Republic of Ireland were playing Northern Ireland in the World Cup qualifier in Windsor Park. And it was a, a dark night, really, for sectarianism. Like the, It was a vicious environment that the game was played in. And I remember that some of the Northern Ireland fans were singing trick or treat. Mm-hmm. Or chanting it during the game as a reference to the trick and treat massacre you mentioned, like you know, and there's a lot of people from the South who didn't travel up to that game out of fear, you know. It was, um, yeah. but the, I was, totally understand that. It's, I mean, at that time, there was just naked sectarian slaughters happening, and why would you want to be caught up in that? It just you can you can completely understand. I even yeah. think to myself, how did anybody go anywhere? How, how could you even go into a bar after things like that happen when you didn't know what would, you know, somebody could come in and just murder people. And that was the reality back then. But people did go to bars. People did go out and they tried to live as normal lives as possible. I mean, Sean Brown, uh, the, the, the caretaker of uh, the Wolf Tones, club and blah hey that was another sectarian naked sectarian kill and he was killed because he was a catholic he was kidnapped and murdered as he closed up the grounds of blah hey ga club and that's like a stone's throw from where i live as well so yeah. you know crazy it's mental so journalism how did you decide to get into journalism or what was the spark that caused you to pursue it as a career i I was a wee bit um, of a daydreamer when I was at school, so I I had notions that I was just going to leave school at sixteen because I just I didn't like it. I didn't like the school I was in. Um, it just I, I didn't have a particularly good time. But um, I, I was really, really, really good at English, and I was crap at everything else. But I was really good at English, and I. I think I wrote something one time before for my English teacher in fifth year. And she said to me, have you ever thought about being a journalist? And I was like, mm, 
not really. So I kind of put it to the back of my head. Then it came to like careers. You had a careers class and I thought, well, what, what looks like glamorous and glitzy? <laughs> so I, I thought about PR. So it's, you know, um, uh, setting up events and, and advertising and all that. So I, uh, I asked my careers teacher, could you get me a spot uh, with a PR company? Tried so hard, couldn't get anywhere. And then she said to me that one of her former pupils was now the health correspondent in the Belfast Telegraph. And because I was good at English, would you consider going there for a couple of days? And I was like, all right, then I'll go. And that was it. That changed it for me. I went to the Belfast Telegraph for two days. And that was when it was a newsroom, three floors, two, maybe three editions out a day. I can't remember. There was a morning or maybe it was just the morning and evening. I can't remember. But uh, just I loved how it was it was a variety of it you, you know one minute you'd be covering I think at that time the World Irish Dancing Championships were being held in Belfast so Claire took me over there and then next thing we'd be back at the office doing something in politics and I just really really loved it it was just it was great and that that was it I was I'm doing journalism and that was me brilliant yeah so when when did you start, we'll say, um, like what age were you when you got into journalism? I, I applied for um, journalism and European studies at the University of Ulster. And then I did a year and then I took a year out. And then I, I really, really wanted to get into it really, really quick. So I remember there was um, a City and Guilds course that was being run in conjunction with the BBC and newspaper and journalism. So I, I did that and I passed it and I just got my first job. And it was that it was the best decision I ever made because had I stayed at university, there was no, there was no, like, I mean, there, there, the, you weren't getting the experience and I just wanted to, to dive straight in. And I'm so glad I did that because the experience I got in the BBC and then I started working for free at the County Dairy Post, which was a new new newspaper set up by River Media. And it was because in South Derry, believe it or not, we, we had a local newspaper called the Middle Stramail, and it, but it, it didn't really cover Gaelic football. And in South Derry, Gaelic football is massive. So the County Dairy Post came along and it was just like this new, fresh newspaper. Um, it was October 2007. It was, you'll know one of the journalists who who, who was working at it at the same time as me, Cahar O'Kane, he now writes for the Irish News. Um, but it was just fresh, it was great, and just gave me a huge buzz. And it wasn't really interesting in crime or anything like that then. Um, but I got my first paid job in February 2008 with the Northern Constitution in Limavada. Uh, County Derry and Lima Valley is one of these wee towns where it's bizarre like everything happens in it um, and sadly I think there was quite a few murders around that time and deaths and then I really got into covering crime and, and courts and things and then um, eventually I moved on to different newspapers I worked in the waterside in Derry in like a unionist paper called the London Derry Sentinel it's brilliant got really good contacts there um, they moved to Mid Ulster, did uh, did the the courts around Dungan and Throne, and um, and then I got a phone call one day to the office from the deputy editor of a newspaper called the Sunday Life, which would would have been one of the biggest Sunday newspapers in Northern Ireland, um, to ask me to do a shift there because they'd read my articles and and they were impressed by me. So I did, I, I went and did a few shifts, then they offered me a contract. And I think within six months, I, I was sent to Peru to interview a, a drug smuggler in prison. So it just took off really quick. Yeah, your website, www.patriciadelton.com has a collection of your main articles there. And there's some fascinating stories in there and some heartbreaking stories in there too, which you want to cover touch on a bit throughout the interview here. A couple of them have left quite an impression on me. But seeing as you mentioned it there, can you maybe tell us about the Peru 2 case yes. going over to Peru? 
Yep. So everybody knows who the Prue Two are. Um, Michaela McCollum, who is a, was a model from uh, Dungannon in County Tyrone, and Melissa Reid, who was um, uh, I don't even know what Melissa did, but she was a, a woman of the same age, around 21, 22, um, from Scotland. They were both in Ibiza at the same time, apparently not together, but they ended up smuggling or trying to smuggle 1.5 million pounds worth of cocaine out of Peru and South America. And I was working on um, the story at the time when she had went missing. This is Michaela. So that was a huge interest to us because she was from Northern Ireland, come from a wee town and, uh, and you know, just a normal girl from here. And her family had posted on social media that week that they hadn't heard from her in four or five days. It was unlike her. She rang home every day and, you know, please help us. And then the celebrities were getting on board, like Tommy Bow putting out the pills, please get anybody in a bath and know, knows where Michaela is, get in touch. No, no word about Melissa Reid at this stage. It was all about Michaela. And then basically within, I think it was five days, um, a Belfast newspaper received a phone call from the Peruvian authorities to say this girl isn't missing. She is in, locked up in Peru after trying to smuggle cocaine. So that's when the story broke. And I'll never forget when it broke. It was a Saturday because that would have been one of my busiest days. It was deadline day. And w I walked into the office and the editor had the Sun newspaper and it was, and, and the headline was uh, missing, missing girl in uh, Peru coke bust and it was like what what how, how did this happen and and then just from that unraveled the, the videos of them in um uh, at the Lima airport being caught with these suitcases full of cocaine we found out that she was with a, a Scottish girl Melissa Reid the videos showed them you know being very they looked very scared and they said and I think their first words were we were forced to carry these bags so we were just keeping on top of the story um, that broke around August 2013. And I mean, it was no matter what anybody says, because a lot of people just even hit the mention of the Prue too, because they don't want to make a drug smuggler a celebrity. But it was a story that everybody was talking about, not just here and in, in the north, the south, even the UK, it was worldwide. Everybody was talking about these two young women who were caught smuggling this, these drugs. So we just kept on. It was nearly every week there was something in the paper. And for me, um, I was only there at the newspapers like six months. And I, I tried to, as part of my job, I just tried to build as, as many contacts as I can. And I ended up getting in touch with a guy over Facebook who, who worked in the prisons. He wasn't a prison guard. He actually went in and did classes with a woman. He was actually a fashion designer. So he went in and, and did classes with the women in these overcrowded jails to kind of give them some hope because those prisons are absolute hell holes. I mean, there's no sanitation or anything and it's, it's a really rough place. So I, I got speaking to him and there was no way of actually contacting Michaela or, you know, because of the language barrier with the authorities, you couldn't really ring up their press office and go, you know, what's happening now? Or could you tell me this? It was just almost impossible. So we decided that we would attempt to go out to Peru. We knew it would be hard to get into the prison because you know, there's certain things that you have to do. You have to wear certain clothes to get into the prison. You have to have certain items with you. And you might even have to, you know, even pay your way into the prison. Um, and that's not even with the guards. The, the prisoners actually run the prison. The guards just uh, police the perimeter inside. It's like a hierarchy. There's a, nearly like a command structure of prisoners and, and they run it. So anyway, we knew all those details and we thought we'll go we'll take the chance to go out uh, and try and speak to her. I had attempted to set up interviews with, with prosecutors, um, even a judge, the police, uh, in case we couldn't get into, you know, the, the president in Peru to see Michaela. And then 
it um, actually everything fell through but the interview with Michaela randomly enough. So we just, yeah, I, br I brought a, a photographer with who's originally from Chile, which is the country beside Peru. Um, and we went over and I think it was within two days we were we were inside the prison sitting speaking to her and I was there for three and a half hours. And I mean, she was just glad to have somebody from home there. And she chatted, she talked, she lied through her teeth. <laughs> and and then and then I left. And that was it. And it just so happened two days later, she was actually sentenced and we went down for the sentencing. And so I saw her going in and getting sentenced. And then it's when it really came out that she 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 had admitted that um, the abduction story where she had said that um, both of them were held hostage and, and brought together. And I don't know where it was, Madrid or somewhere like that, um, uh, or Gran Canaria, I'm not too sure. Um, and forced on a plane to Peru and made to take, to take the cocaine was just a load of lies. So, and then I think it's the point that the, the, the tide started to turn for Michaela because when, when it first broke that she was caught with cocaine, there was a lot of sympathy for her. People fundraised to buy her mattresses, bedding, everything. And then it, it kind of, I think the public felt that she was pulling or thought she was pulling the wool over their eyes I, I really do believe to this day had she had just said look I'm, I'm absolutely stupid I, I, I agreed to do this I had no money and, and and she could have turned it around and actually went in and helped young people stay away from it and, and um, highlight the dangers of when you're going abroad and, and you know the drug scourge and everything but Michaela just wanted to be a celebrity, sadly, and she thought she could be one. But, you know, it's, it's a stigma that will never leave her, that she's a, an international drug smuggler. Are they out of prison now? Yep, they're both yeah. out of prison, living very different lives. Melissa came out um, and she went straight home to Scotland. And as far as I'm aware, she works in a charity She's turned down numerous um, opportunities to do stories, to do documentaries, to tell her side of the story. She just wants to move on with her life. Whereas Michaela's kind of grasped every opportunity she can to, you know, be on TV or be in the press. And I mean, that includes even paparazzi pics of her in the park or filling up her car. And, you know, so... She's, she definitely doesn't have the public sympathy on her side. I think there's a little bit more respect there for Melissa than there would be for Michaela. Mm. Another story you would have investigated and did, did a lot of work on was the Noah Donahue case. Mm -hmm. For people who are not famil familiar with the case listening in, could you maybe just maybe summarise yeah. what that was about? Yeah. Um, Noah Donahue was a 14-year-old mixed-race schoolboy. He lived in North sorry South Belfast he um, went missing during the first lockdown in June 2020 he'd left his home to go and visit friends uh, they were meeting up at a, a a place called Cave Hill Country Park in Belfast to carry out their um, uh, preparations for the Duke of Edinburgh award, award which is like a scout sort of school scheme and he left that day and he never returned home. He never met his friends. He never got to his destination. And in the days after it, a huge uh, missing persons operation, the biggest that Belfast has ever had, uh, started. The police put out multiple appeals. It transpired throughout the, the week that Noah became separated from his belongings, including his rucksack, which was had gone completely missing. That his clothes had been uh, discarded. Um, no one actually seen Noah taking off his clothes in an area that was off route of where he was supposed to be uh, and that he did not know. And... There was then footage of Noah completely unclothed where he's seen going around the back of a house um, where there is an entrance to a storm drain. 
again, Noah did not know where that storm drain was. Um, there's also a wooded area behind behind the houses. And sadly, um, six days later, his body was found um, at the other end, uh, quite a, a distance away from where that entrance to that storm drain is, um, close to the, uh, the, um, the M2 motorway in Belfast. And I mean, it just broke everybody's hearts because um, so many people came together from, from both sides of the community. No one went missing in what would be seen as a, 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 a Protestant and slash loyalist area. Um, and everybody came together to look for him and everybody's hearts were broken. And I mean, seeing his, his mother, you know, at his funeral a few days later, you know, the pain on her face, it was just, it was horrendous. But what happened and what transpired after that was that the family felt that there, the police weren't investigating Noah's death in the way they believed um, it, it should have been investigated. Firstly, when Noah's body was found in the storm drain just a few hours later, a senior PSNA officer told the media that um, police didn't suspect any foul play. But, I mean, an autopsy hadn't even been t hadn't even taken place on Noah's body. So how could anyone, including the PSNA officer, say that? And I mean, the police also lied a few weeks later to the family that. Um, uh, leaflets asking for information about uh, you know Noah had you seen Noah you know was there any CCTV to residents in that area they lied and said that the leaflet drop had been carried out it actually hadn't they had a I, I don't even know if they apologized to the family I think they told them it was a miscommunication but it's a, it's a strange mis miscommunication so basically in a nutshell Paul Jake the, the family feel and, and, and quite a lot of people feel here in, in uh, not only the north but the south that, that there's there's too many unanswered questions around Noah's death. Um, I, I, um, I had been helping Donald McIntyre with a documentary um, on Noah which will come out after his inquest happens. Uh, there's been so many conspiracy theories, Podrick, you know, was was Noah harmed? His family believe he was harmed. Um, they want to know why certain things weren't carried out by the police, um, and 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 they want to know why over two years on, why why did they not have any answers as to what happened that day? How can a how can a little boy leave his house on a bike to meet his friends, and and just disappear no one no one saw him taking his clothes off no one saw him enter that storm drain no one seems to know very little it's it's just it's it's the strangest most saddest case I've ever worked on and I I've always offered my support to the family because I mean that's they deserve to know what happened Noah and they deserve answers especially from the authorities the fact that he was slightly naked as well were kind of Mm -hmm. a number of questions why is he doing that like you know what i mean he probably was forced of his clothes at that stage think... like you know that would kind of it would be logical that something definitely happened there you know um you're saying as well in previous interviews that his laptop was taken and yeah. a, a convicted criminal tried to sell it in a pawn shop yep sorry i actually forgot about that very important point Noah's, um, Noah had been carrying a rucksack with his laptop and school books that day when he left. And um, when the police searches were being carried out, now there's, an, there's been a number of item, items never recovered. Um, they've never been found, including Noah's underwear. They've never been recovered. Some of his clothing has, others haven't. But during the first three days of searches, the police put out a pail for this khaki rucksack uh, that no owned because it just disappeared. No one knew where, you know, where it was. And it transpired, well, at the time, police said that a member of the public had handed it in. What actually had happened was a convicted uh, uh, criminal, a career criminal, um, with serious convictions for 
for violence, including holding a gun to a man's head, um, had tried to pawn Noah's laptop with a woman two days into the search for Noah, two or three days into the search for Noah. And I think it may have been the man in the pawn shop who actually raised the alarm because there had been an appeal for this. So he was apprehended quite quickly. The laptop was discovered in the rim of a, a hostel, a hostel that was just metres away from Noah's home and a hostel that Fiona, his mother, has said um, that she has raised concerns about drug use prior to Noah going missing. So uh, Daryl Paul, the, uh, the career criminal I speak about, uh, was convicted for, for theft uh, eventually over Noah's laptop. And um, as far as I know, another woman is facing charges in relation to that. I'm not too sure about the state of, of the court proceedings, so I have to be careful around that. So, I mean, once again, doesn't make any sense. Um, Daryl Paul claims he found Noah's rucksack. I mean, what a find. Um, claims he didn't know that it belonged to Noah. Yet and all, he, there were school books for Noah's name in that bag, which Daryl Paul just chucked under the bin. And, I mean, it was the biggest story in Belfast that, that week. How could they not know that that belonged to Noah if they did just find it? The PS now claim that Daryl Paul couldn't have harmed Noah because he was in a different part of the city, caught in CCTV when Noah, just they claim, discarded his bag or became separated from his bag in a wooden walkway, which you can't really see. And it's, you know, one of those wooden walkways that when construction work's taking place and still allowed pedestrians to pass. So you can't really see in there. And in fact, there was only, I think, <laughs> around 20 cameras, if even CCTV cameras, um, that picked him up that day from South Belfast to the other side of Belfast, which I think in this day and age, and probably one of the most um, CCTV covered cities in at least Europe, that that's strange too. But again, unanswered questions. No one knows why that is. Could a theory be put forward that there is collusion with the PSNI and the paramilitary group? I, I don't. Well, I've, I, I could. I'm a journalist, so I couldn't say what I that I believe that. I, there's, there's that many different uh, theories. And see, to be honest, Project, all the family wants is facts. They don't, they don't need theories. But they have a very, very, very strong um, belief that the, the PS and I did not do their job. And that is the subject of a police ombudsman investigation. It, there's over 80 points um, raised by the family and their legal team in, in that complaint. I mean, that's, that's serious. Yeah. Sounds horrendous. Like I saw Noah's mum on James English recently, mm -hmm. which was... Um, heartbreaking to listen to so we hope that she gets justice and fair play to you for your role and in, in covering the story and thank you yeah my mother was self logic and uh, i mean if uh, i just hope that had it have been me or, or my child i just would hope that somebody would help me so um i know the donahoe family are a lovely family and who are going through hell and yeah. and and it's, it's their right to, to have answers and find out exactly what happened, Noah. And they have always said, if by some chance Noah, Noah's death was accidental, or they would accept that. But everything is pointing to that's not the case. And, and, and they have strong reasons to believe why, why, why they have you know, that theory. Yeah. Just moving on to your own kids, dear Patricia, you've had your own battles with social media trolls and you've become a victim of harassment and threats and your family has as well. Would you maybe yeah. give an insight into the level of abuse you have received as a result of the work that you do? Yeah. So uh, 
I started receiving abuse around, um, it would have to be, yeah, it was January 2019. And I know what the catalyst for it was. I can pinpoint it. Um, I covered the murder of a man in East Belfast called Ian Ogle. Ian Ogle uh, was a loyalist, father of two, um, who was butchered to death in the street as he prayed while pastor. And he was butchered to death by a gang linked to East Belfast UVF. And it was a horrific murder. He, I mean, he lay dying in, in, his, in one of his children's arms. And the thing was that it was paramilitary linked. So once again, it, we have these, these organized crime groups who wrap themselves in the flag, just slaughtering people um, who live in their own communities that they claim to protect. So I, I met the family, I did a story, as did many other media outlets. Um, and at the time, and Tony, or Ian's daughter, Tony, I, I, I'll say this and I'll always say it. I believe she's one of the most bravest women I've ever met because she lives in that community, which there is still a course of control going on. There's still people who are getting threatened, who are getting kneecapped, who are getting shot, who are just, I mean, being ruled by an iron fist by these paramilitaries. She stood up and she spoke out and she, and she said, you know, my my father has been the victim of an 18 month intimidation campaign and so has our family um by by the by East Belfast UVF and um what what I found then Podrick was more and more people at that time were also speaking out about what happened to them what the UVF had done to them fining them sending you know heavies to their door attacking their homes putting graffiti up about people basically nearly driving people to suicide um in in those areas uh, i had so many people came forward so so i started covering covering those incidents more a lot of the people were too scared to go on the record but we highlighted it and helped them like i mean there's numerous people who had to leave east belfast over it including somebody a family of eight who um, had to leave their house of 11 years because it had been attacked that many times. They, they were actually having raw meat dumped on their doorstep as a death threat. So I did start doing that more and more. And as I did that, um, that smear ca campaign would start. And I mean, one of the individuals involved in that, he's very well known. Um, and uh, I just can't, I, I kind of just brushed it off at the start. You know, lies would go on social media that, you know, the stories were lies that weren't true. And then it started into abuse and then it became sectarian. And I always do believe there is an element of sectarianism and the abuse that I received because it was mostly from loyalists. Um, and I mean, ordinary loyalists should never have anything to abuse me about because um, they these paramilitaries don't represent loyalism. I have really good friends who are loyalists who are disgusted by them. That These were, were criminals who are torturing and terrorizing their own communities. But I mean, you, you weren't getting that through to people. So the abuse started. And I think the real turning point for me was one April. I, I just, it was relentless one day and people comments somebody put up a actually it was a facebook page put up a link to my personal facebook page um which wasn't under my full name i'd changed it but they put a direct link and then i started getting messages of abuse and one woman she had written underneath the post that oh i see she has children i hope she has to bury them um and then another person said that uh, uh, that I would end up like Veronica Guerin um, with a, an emoji with a explosion and then other people were just calling me a rat, an informer or every name under the sun and I remember this one individual who I'd, I'd named in the paper as Ulster's most dangerous criminal because he had like 260 convictions because of that post he messaged me as well and just had to take my Facebook down after a while because it was just so brittle and I mean it just it just snowballed from there really um 
project it snowballed and then in October and I never went to the police about it I really should have um but I was kind of made to believe wrongly that because you're a crime journalist you just have to deal with it and uh and that's it it's part of your job so time went on um I actually had my little boy who's two uh now I had him in the middle of this all uh, so I took about two, two or three months off work because I was freelance, so I don't get maternity pay. So I was back trying to juggle a newborn baby and and everything was from my work. And um, in October 2019, I woke up one morning to this Facebook message to, to my to the account, which I'd reactivated um, again, saying, don't go near your granny's house. Uh, Trisha or you'll watch your newborn get raped and it was signed off in the neo-Nazi in the name of a neo-Nazi group called Combat 18 which in the past has had links to loyalist paramilitaries so um, it was just I remember my, my son he was only a few months old I was just I said no that's it this, I'm going to the place now I, I, I actually this has crossed the line for me so I did I went to the police, I reported it, and like I, I walked into that station and I just thought, well, they have to do something. Like, you know, I, I could understand them not investigating somebody calling you a prostitute or, a, you know, calling you sectarian names. But this, this is a different level now, it involves my child. So I did, I, I reported it. And unfortunately, a year passed and I, I, I just, I just thought, no it's this isn't going anywhere why isn't going anywhere within this year I've been told it had been traced to an individual somebody I'd written about before a very dangerous individual involved in paramilitaries um and also neo-nazi groups um I was told that he had moved to Scotland that the PS and I were now working with police Scotland and tracking him down um and then after a year I I was forced to get my own legal advice and um, my sister, Kevin Winters, then filed a police ombudsman complaint, which um, a few months later ruled in my favour that police had actually not even adequately investigated my complaint. And a lot of the things that I was being told were lies. I was told from the January that they were um, uh, working with Police Scotland. The PS and I didn't contact Police Scotland to June. So I've just been told lies living in absolute terror worried that uh, am I going to run into this person like am I going to see him uh, you know he's threatened to <laughs> the most abhorrent thing he could threaten about a baby and it was it was just it was a nightmare Podrick so I was left down by the, the, the authorities um, and in between all of that the death threats were coming thick and fast police coming to your door um uh there's an imminent attack going to be carried out against you by criminal elements. Um, one of them was that it was going to be shot dead within 48 hours at a specified location. Another one, and this was from the police. This wasn't just somebody writing this on the internet. It was coming from police intelligence. Um, and the, I think the other one was that it would be um, entrapped by being asked to go do a story. And uh, I would be attacked and uh, my, my car, there was another threat to attack me when I was in a certain loyalist area in East Belfast that my car would be attacked. So it was just, you know, I look back now on, on that time, Podrick, and I know it was only 2020, 2019, 2020. And even up until February last year, um, my name was being spray painted on walls in East Belfast with Gun Cross there. I just look back to myself and I just think, I, I don't know how I got through that because it was you were constantly running on adrenaline. I was constantly just just not myself and just it was horrible. It was really horrible and my mental health did definitely suffer. But I couldn't talk about it because I didn't want those people behind it, particularly the individual behind the smear campaign, to think that um, they had you know what they were doing was working and. Uh, so I just I just carried on and and just you know when I had a lot of support and uh, quite a lot of people on Twitter were very kind to me and I've made so many friends actually through it um, that I'll be forever grateful for um, 
who supported me through that very hard time. So I'm just glad now that I'm a, in a different place and I'm very happy and um, touch wood. There's been no other issues. Um, the guy who threatened to rape my newborn son eventually did come back to Northern Ireland. He was brought in for a voluntary interview and released. And apparently there's a fail away to the PPS, but I mean, I just don't have much hope because it's been caught. It was June last year, the fail was sent to the PPS. I, I don't think he'll, he'll face court, but maybe I'm wrong. And then, you know, maybe, maybe he will. And that, that's a, another battle I have to go through. I'll have to go to court, maybe face this man, but I'll just cross that bridge when I come to it. An absolute scumbag, like, but... Um... Yeah. No, to be fair, you are one of the strongest women I know, Patricia, like, you know, to, to put up Thank with that, to come through that, to come out the other side. Like, how did you manage to sleep at night when all this was going on? You know, it must have been very there hard. Nights, you know, there, was, there was nights I didn't sleep. I mean, there was, I was just, I, I just can't even answer because it just, I got, it had to be adrenaline. I I'm, had to be running on adrenaline all the time. That, that must be. And actually, when I came away from it, and I felt, my, I felt actually felt myself going back to somewhere that I even forgot. I, I you know, I, I forgot who I really was. I forgot to, I, I, I actually normalized all that. And it should never have been normalized. And I'm just glad now that I'm, I've got peace in my life and I can just, go and do what I love doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I went to see a counsellor one time. Uh, this is no word of a lie. Went to see a counsellor one time and she said to me, and it was at, it was NHS through my own doctor. I told her everything that had happened. She just said, Trisha, I'm really sorry, but I can't help you. I help people who have anxiety for no reason. Everything that you have, you have I mean, that you have anxiety for is, is of course you're going to have anxiety. Because I think you need to speak to somebody who's more equipped in dealing with journalists and threats. And God love her, she was embarrassed even saying that to me. And then I just thought, flip sake, like what do I do? What do I do? Who do you talk to? But no, I, I have I've, I've getting brilliant support and um, do you know what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, like I say. So I definitely am stronger, but I don't fancy going back to the, all those, those few years. Definitely not. Did you consider getting out in Northern Ireland? Because that would have been my first reaction myself. So I could... Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. But then, you know, then the win and then... And then they'll just move on to somebody else. I think you have to stand your ground. And um, and I do, I honestly do believe those people who, who came to me and did stories, they have made a difference. There is, there is, there's been a huge difference made. Um, there's a lot of pressure on certain paramilitaries now to transition from being paramilitaries into something else and to moving away. I do think, I just, I do believe it, 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 it is we need people to speak out and we need journalists who are willing to give them a platform and if we we'll end up like Russia if we, if we if we you know just move away. So no, I'm happy here. My children are happy here. My children were always shielded um from what was going on with me. Like my children wouldn't know about all that and you know, so they're too young anyway. So, you know, why should I leave? I was just going to say, like, did you manage to keep it from them? during the height of it. Yeah, I, I did, you know, but the toughest thing about it was when the police are given your death threats and it involves your children, they're, you're then, they're then asking you, where's your son's nursery? Give us the address. Where's your son's school? Give us the address. Where's your daughter's school? Like, what's, what's your, my daughter had a mobile, what's her mobile number? So we can put it in a rapid response system as she rings. So we know, you know, to get there quick, quick, quicker. Mm. It's it's just this things a mother should never have to do, or no journalist should have to do either. But it's the reality of of Northern Ireland, which it I mean it was just absolutely toxic for during the pandemic. There was multiple death threats against journalists, and that was a year after Laramie Key was 
um, murdered in the streets today by a Republican gunman. So, you know, it, uh, it doesn't even people losing their lives doesn't seem to make a difference. They still carry on threatening and intimidating. And the worry is, I, you know, there, I think most of these threats, you know, you take a pinch of salt. But of, unfortunately, there's like lunatics out there that would just, you know, especially like internet lunatics who could who could do something again and, and do something. That was always my worry, the lunatics, not really these so-called paramilitaries, you know. Yeah. My family were very supportive and but they just didn't want me to um they didn't want me to they didn't want me to carry on doing my job, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. So, so and do you have do you have support around you like now at the minute, like you know, yeah. You have... Oh yeah, absolutely. I just yeah, I get on with it and just as I'm in a completely different place than I was this time last year. And I don't, um, I no longer work um, in newspapers and I'm absolutely bloody delighted that I don't. Mm-hmm. I, I'll be honest with you, I am absolutely delighted that I do not work in newspapers. And people might say that's a, a sad thing to say, but let's just say I'm a lot happier now that I, I'm out of out of that. Environment, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you've campaigned a lot for other journalists like Martin O'Hagan, Justice for Martin O'Hagan, Justice for Lyra McKee. So it mm-hmm. is a dangerous environment to be a journalist. Uh, you, uh, Northern Ireland is considered the most dangerous place in the UK, according to reporters with Out Borders, to be a journalist. It's the most dangerous. And um, and we're only a wee tiny place. So why, why, why is it so dangerous? Why... 20 plus years after the Good Friday Agreement, is it dangerous to be a journalist? Why? Why do why we allowing, allowing this to happen? And there's so many people I put that responsibility on, from politicians to police and everything. I just believe that there's there's certain there's certain crime gangs associated politically that are allowed to exist. And I'd love to know why. Is it because there's so many informers that it's easier to kind of keep tabs on them and and you know get the odd drug seizure and then just but you know at least at least they're not killing each other. At least it's not back to the troubles. I've just I've, I just believe really if 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 we wanted to do something about these gangs, they could be dismantled very, very easily. We only have to look at what um, ha- has happened with the new IRA. It's on its knees. It's, it, you know, these people who were murdering um, uh, police officers and uh, members of the army are now on their knees. They've been completely dismantled. There's uh, 10 suspects before the court at, at present. And that was done. And it was, it was given, those orders were given from, from um, the UK British government, Theresa May gave that order to dismantle that gang with the help of MI5 um, uh, after Lear McKee's murder. And within what what was it a year? It, it was dismantled. These like these the, the same gang was put, putting bombs underneath police officers' cars up until I think la- was it last April there was one. But the, according to the press and according to what's in the courts, the, the the bomb maker has been, you know, he's he's been charged with offences, um, and, and other individuals, and it's and there you go. That's how you do it. Why can't they do it with other gangs, especially loyalist crime gangs, like that are flooding their communities with drugs and uh, and being carrying out attacks and intimidating people. One article that left a huge impression on me was the article you wrote about a man who was groomed by the UBF as a teenager. Now, his name was kept confidential in location and all that. He's no, he's no longer in Northern Ireland. But some of the stuff shocked me reading it that, you know, mm-hmm. if if a member was working on the day of a band parade, they had to call in sick and go to the band parade practice or stuff like that, or else they get a beating when they go back next, you know, the interrogation yeah. training as well that to be kind of enlisted into it you had to undergo interrogation training where 
random guys masked will come in and beat you up for a few hours to see can you withstand mm-hmm. the pressure of not informing just yeah, m- yeah. mental stuff like people being blackmailed into having to buy their way out of it and then not honoring the agreement when they have paid the money mm-hmm. having to join because they've been fined for antisocial behavior dealing drugs and then when they can't pay they're, they're forced to join the whole thing is like blackmail in a lot of cases like you know and it's a horrific circle to be caught in and it shocked me really you know to be honest with you well that that young man came forward to me after the disorder that broke out in the streets of Belfast last year in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol. So I don't know if you remember, Padraig, the images of the buses being hijacked yeah. and set on fire by teenagers, the um, carjackings, the riot in the streets, and it was all it was all teenagers. Um, he came forward and, and he it was just before that he, he left Northern Ireland. He made the decision that he had to go because he joined the UVF from the age of, I think it was 16 or 17. Um, and he was now in his mid-20s and he knew that he couldn't get out of it. Um, and I think the only way to get out of it was for him to get a punishment beaten, bizarrely. Um, so w- what he told me was just absolutely shocking. These guys are, they are, they, they're like groomers. They, they groom these young people into believing that, you know, being in a paramilitary gang is like a badge of honor and that all, you know, you get all these really good things. In reality, they were just being sent out to do the dirty work um, of, of grown men who just sat in their living rooms with their extorted money or drug money um, and, and sent to do terrible things that even they wouldn't do. For example, there was, um, I think this struck me the most, that this guy had, um, the story this guy told me, he was in school and he was summoned to a meeting. Um, and he, uh, after school, he went to the meeting and he was told to go um, put out a, a foreign family from a street in Belfast. So I think it was maybe a Romanian family. And he was told that there was a pedophile living in the house, so he needed to be put out, put him out of the area. So that would involve going masked to this this house, breaking in, and and attacking attacking them, attacking this pedophile. So they went in, they did it. They um they beat up a man in front of his wife, and uh, the cries that you said the cries were just that were terrible. And he said he went back into school the next day and he sat down in class and the teacher announced that a, a student, I think it was a girl, wouldn't be back because her family were attacked last night in Belfast and put out. And he said he just slid down the seat and he just, he knew it was him. He knew that that was me. And it turned out that the man wasn't a pedophile at all. It was lies. And that's what they did. You were sent to, they, they were saying, or he was saying, sorry, they were sent to, to different homes of people and, and and forcing people out or or basically surveillance and people who owed money and then maybe he waiting for them to go down the wrong entry and attacking them. And it was awful. And I, your heart breaks for, for someone like that who, who comes from perhaps not a very wealthy area um and who's who thinks that they're getting into sort of like a a cool gang with a wee bit of influence in reality it's just it's it's just it's just criminality and and they'll end up worse off for it and and even the people that are that you're working for end up i mean kneecapping you it's just it's it's crazy and and it can only happen here why does yeah. it stop happen? There's another part where he said he actually had to give his own friends a beating if they missed. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, grade practice or or meetings yeah. or stuff like that, or not that's paying good. their money, like you know, and having to buy your way out of it. Yeah, they've been told to come back two years later, and they said it's a bit late now, lads. It was just it was a horrific. I'm going to put the link in the. Yeah, please do. Yeah. It really um, kind of opened up my eyes and yeah, you know, it, it actually opened my eyes. 
because I, I write about this, so you hear it happens, but um, and, and I, I have quite a lot of contacts, but I, I, it was shocking to hear that someone so young w- was still going through that. And, and he was explaining that the reason that these, these, these young people who are out rioting and, and hijacking buses, they're being told to do that by, you know, by older people. Yeah. Um, and I suppose the one kind of myth that's kind of put out there is that paramilitaries protect communities in Northern Ireland from drug dealing and that. But they just charge protection money for drug dealing. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? For, so it's not really protecting the community then? No, no, they, they have no interest in protecting the community. They're more interested in lining in their own pockets and protecting anybody in the community. Yeah, it's a convenient kind of flag, as you say, rat for step in the flag. And it's not just the loyalist side of the thing, like, there is the Republican yeah. side as well, like, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. We hope, with the way you mentioned about the protocol there and in the article, I suppose, you could, in the videos, you could see adults directing kids, you, you know, in the in the writing, while not getting their own hands dirty. Mm-hmm. The protocol in our Ireland is taking a bit of a back foot in the resource, taking a step it's not a main focus right now at the minute with the situation in Ukraine and that. But how would you see it playing out? Do you think that there'll be a resolution to the protocol to the Brexit situation or are we looking at another resumption of the troubles? Well, uh, I think the latest was that there was some sort of high court challenge by a number of unionists slash loyalists. And it was, uh, they, they claimed that the, the, it was unlawful and the judge has said, no, it's actually not unlawful. And I think there's talk of it going to the Supreme Court. Um, apparently, Liz Trust said, I mean, the focus isn't on triggering Article 16 at the moment with the Ukrainian war that's going on. So, yeah, it has taken a back seat. I, I, I say, to be honest, Podrick, you can't trust the British government. And unfortunately, those who supported Brexit here have learned that the hard way, including the DUP. I don't trust any of them. I couldn't even predict what what could happen. You just don't know. But I mean, I've heard a few people say, I mean, it's, it's here to stay and that's just the way it's going to be. But to be honest, I don't know. And I think it happened with the, the, the Tory government. So... Would you be confident of seeing a united Ireland in our lifetime? Well, I think that it's there's I mean, more chance of a united Ireland now than there was five years ago. I'm not saying that that, that it's going to happen, but with what's happened with Brexit uh, and the protocol and you know the so-called weakening of the union, and I'll be honest, the Tories don't seem to give too much. Um, consideration to Northern Ireland so I mean it's there's definitely more talk about it and you can see why you mm. can there is a fear that if Ireland was to be united that the Lilas would bring a bombing campaign down south in protest mm. that is a, a real possibility would you say we could have a similar yeah. war in our hands like no. I per- no, I personally don't think that that could ever happen. No, I I mean, where are they getting all this? Where are they where are they going to get their this equipment from? There there may be loyalist paramilitaries, but I don't believe any of them are equipped enough to carry out that kind of campaign. Like, sadly, maybe there could be one or two incidents, but no. I, I, that's my personal opinion. I, do, I don't think it. I mean, they're more interested in dealing drugs. So. One of the biggest atrocities in the Troubles, which kind of is, doesn't get as much notice as, or much press as what happened in Northern Ireland itself, is the Dublin Monaghan bombings. Like there was a mm-hmm. large number of people died yeah. in that attack, and mm-hmm. no one's actually been held account for it. So they have. Previous of doing it, I suppose that would be a concern I would have, you know. But um, even though it will be nearly fifty years ago in a couple of years, it's like, so but sad. yeah, I passed. Uh, I used to work on Talbot Street, and I passed the the memorial every single day. And look, that was those were different times, and uh, I mean that was, and I, 
can't recall one of the individuals, his name, who was involved in that, but those were, those were different times, different uh, types of groups. Um, and I, I would hope, uh, I think everybody would hope that nothing like that would ever, ever happen again. The Miami Show Band Massacre is another story you kind of covered. Mm-hmm. And you spoke to a survivor yeah. of that, and that there was like a British, it's believed that a British secret agent, Robert Narak, Mm-hmm. Involved. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. Yeah, you're right. And and a guy Stummerville as well. Um, the I mean, they they just that was. I remember speaking to Stephen Travers, who's one of the survivors as well, separately to to Des, and he, he he told about how um one of the band members was shot fourteen times in the face because he was considered the, the heartthrob of the group. So, I mean, those people who who, uh, who killed that day, and, I mean, the bomb ended up killing them as well. But, I mean, the hatred that they must have had, just because, well, why? Well, why did they target that band? I think it was to make, um, they were going to claim that uh, the band was carrying a, a bomb over the border, the IRA, by planting it on there. But I just to those, you know, incidents like the Miami Show Band, and I just think, how could how how did we live in a place where there was so much hate that led to such brutal murders and such a terrible loss that even I mean, bands can be targeted, yeah. and innocent people. It's just, yeah, it's a fair play to Stephen Travers, and uh, he he has just been so great and campaigning um for for justice and, and helping other victims as well i i don't i don't know where he gets the strength from i'm sure he's dealt with some severe trauma surrounding that so fair play to him i think there was a very good line as well when he was saying at a, at a school presentation can you tell the difference in the picture which are catholic and which are protestants mm-hmm. it kind of brings it home like you know that yeah same people the same same belief they believe in the same god it's just a different brand of christianity like you know and yeah. it's no. mental moving on to another shocking article that i saw on your site um all right i'm going to put the image up there now but it's quite disturbing as the heads up mm-hmm. people watching about terry louise graham mm-hmm. about the physical abuse she suffered from her ex greg Logue. Mm-hmm. yeah and yep. what domestic abuse looks like. I mean, her in this story. Yeah. Terry Louise was left looking uh, like, and she, this was her own words, the elephant man. Yeah. He should have been strangled with a clothesline. She'd been beaten up, beaten to a pulp. And that was eight years of abuse and she only escaped I think I think she only escaped because she was basically left in hospital for dead. Um, she's just a brave woman. The man who abused her was her partner, the father of her children. He ended up getting thirteen years, I believe, for it. He's actually now out. Um, Terry Louise was left with brain damage from from those attacks. So yeah, um, it's another brave lady. I've covered a lot of domestic abuse cases, and you see, you know. Some women never get any type of justice, and sadly, some women, as we've seen, especially over lockdown, don't get out of it alive. Yeah, I was just going to make the point, and I think I mentioned to you beforehand that one of the national airports in Northern Ireland mm-hmm. is named after a self confessed domestic abuser mm-hmm. in George Best. And it's one of the things I, I know people can say, Oh, you're a Liverpool fan, and you're only saying this. and from a loyalist mm-hmm. background and all that. But you know do believe that George Best was a low life in a lot of ways, a guy who wasted his talent. He was donated a kidney that he wasted, essentially, and openly bragged about abusing women. You know, went on record as saying that, I think it was at Gaza at the time, was in trouble for, for hitting his wife or whatever. And we all give the wife a good slap when we go home. I know I do. Yeah. On a record saying that, glorifying it, and he was just really, uh, even though he treated Alex 
like Alex was a, his his wife and I was a stunning looking woman about 30 years younger than him like you know and he treated her like absolute shit he was the batterer you know and I just it orcs me how a scumbag like that who wasted his talent to put it bluntly you know, he was a very gifted footballer there's no dispute in that mm-hmm. but he wasted his talent and you know for him to have an airport named after him I think in my opinion I don't think he's a, a, a hero of Northern Ireland I don't know, as someone who's from Northern Ireland, would you agree with that? Or? Well, actually, I think it was last week or the week before, a, a new mural has went up in Belfast dedicated to George Best. And uh, there's George Best is, I mean, one, considered one of the most talented footballers to ever have come from Northern Ireland. He'll always be part of history here. And, uh, I mean... He's not only famous here, he's famous across the world. And uh, he's considered one of the most favorite, fa- famous sons. He had very public battles. And if my, my, my point would be, what is taking George Best's name off of that airport going to achieve? Is it going to stop domestic violence? Because if it would, I would agree with it. But I mean, I just... What's it going to achieve? Are we going to have to get rid of all the murals, all the tributes to him? There was a hotel actually due to open called the George Best Hotel. Well, you know, it, it didn't for other reasons, but are we to we wipe him from history? I don't know what the answer is to it. I can't, I can't really form an opinion. Like, I mean, he was what he was. He admitted it. Uh, I'm not saying that. I'm, I believe you me. I, I absolutely detest domestic abusers, male and female. But it wasn't like he was like Jimmy Savile, where he was, you know, this bloody monster that we didn't even know. No one knew. Well, people did know, but didn't say anything. So um, I I don't don't really know what to say to that, Podrick, because I'm a wee bit conflicted. I mean, and and that's not saying that I, I think a domestic abuser should be, you know, um, glorified in any way. It's just... It's George Beth. He's he's just he's part of history in Northern Ireland. It's probably what a lot of people would think first of when you think of, you know, um, um, very important people from Northern Ireland who came. It would be George Best would be the top top of that list. So what do uh, you do? Yeah, I suppose the point I'm kind of making is is that society at times can honour the wrong ty- kind of people. Of course, hundred percent. Yeah, even absolutely. role models in today's society are kind of, yeah, you know, yeah. and I suppose a lot of the recent footballers as well, like Mason Greenwood, Ryan Giggs. Exactly. There is kind of a May United link there, which obviously people are going to say is biased. But oh but yeah, there's a huge. I mean, what is what is going on that we have so many high-profile footballers who have so many issues? What's going on? It, the, these men have the world at their feet it has to be something to do with money and power I don't know but it's horrible and uh, yeah you've reminded me of Gr- Mason Greenwood and those allegations oh hard to refute them and they're yeah. filmed as well you know or recorded mm-hmm. there's another just anecdote about George Best I just want to share as well I was reading in Eamon Dunphy's book that he shared a dress room with George Best and George Best stepped to one of his teammates girlfriends and in the bedroom of the girlfriend, the, his teammate had written love letters to her, which he took from the bedroom and read them out in the dressing room in front of the, the whole team. Oh, so that, that, that kind goodness. of gives a kind of uh, an insight into what kind of scumbag he was, you know. Um, I don't know. I just, I was, I was, I was not a, never, never a fan of him. And I remember as well, he was, there was a, a video on YouTube where Paul Morrison had just tested positive for cocaine and you know, at the time an Arsenal player and literally George Best was there just literally calling him a junkie and kind of as if he was a higher class addict than Paul Morrison like you know of calling yeah, him a junkie but, and all yeah, that and yeah. I don't know I just well, thought he was I just think he was a deplorable individual and I don't know I just I'm not, yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan yeah. of the guy uh, listen when 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 that when the airport was first named uh, I think there was a story in the Times that that said that um, it, people were conflicted here over it, and um, a, a radio poll, had, a radio station ran a poll, and 
which claimed 48% of those who voted said that it shouldn't be named after him. So there is people that, you know, do have that opinion. I yeah. just, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, I really don't know how I feel about it because, it, you know, it, I suppose it, it takes, no one really, no one calls it George Bell's airport anyway. It's Belfast City Airport. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it just I suppose it's just kind of a just an observation. It's interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting discussion. It definitely yeah. is. I have a lady coming on the podcast. You're going to open the floodgates now for female guests on the, the podcast. So that's good. To, as I said, it wasn't by design that yeah. Uh, it was just the way it just worked out over, yeah. over the past year. But um I have a lady coming on in the summer that once a court case is finished, she had 27 years of domestic violence with the same mm-hmm. guy. Like, there's prison sentences shorter than that, you know? Um, so I suppose that'll give another insight. Did you personally yourself ever experience domestic violence? That you I did. From? I did. I was in a really, really toxic relationship um, from the age of 16 to 19. And it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty toxic. And... Uh, um, there was domestic violence involved and it was horrendous um, and, but that's the only time I've experienced it and thank God I made out of it you know, I got out of it in the wrong pace but it was it was totally course of control physical violence and and um, I was just I mean it was my first serious boyfriend but uh, it was. I was actually just thinking about it the other week because, you know, we kind of, you don't see it as domestic violence. It's not ridiculous. Like, you don't yeah. see it at the time. But um, you you, you kind of realise then years later. And I remember my, I remember a family member sent me down and saying to me, see, they kind of knew. And they said to me, like, he's going to kill you. We're actually supposed to be going on holiday, I think, before we broke up and we I, she sat me down and said he'll kill you the guy, he's going to kill you on this holiday please don't go we broke up anyway the police were involved I was attacked one night he attacked me in the street and then um, the police, and a woman saw it and she phoned the police thank God so then it was after that then that just thank God that was me out of it So, but it took that to happen for yeah. me to get out of that relationship yeah. Was it an older man at the time? He was a he was about Two or three years older than me, so yeah, he was older. Yeah, there yeah. seems to be a pattern, and even yeah. in the George Best case, like we have an older man mm-hmm. controlling a younger woman, like there's kind of a pattern we yeah. through the different cases, you know. Yeah. Fair and I, to oh, like, thank you. I remember, it, I know now, but you don't think it at the time, like he clearly he had loads of issues himself, like, you know, he he obviously obviously had low self esteem and he obviously took things out on me, but um, yeah, you don't see it as clearly when you're in the middle of it. But no, thank you. That's the first time I've actually ever talked about that. So, very good. Did it affect like? Did it make you hate men in no. later years? Like, or kind of no, you know, not get at on all. very well with like even with Steve and Lee in the show? Like, you're, you're you know you're very yeah, like, no, not at all. And I wouldn't be. Uh, do you know what I hear? I, I, I he see a lot of um, you know things on social media and there's you know I'm I mean I don't I don't want to be one of these women that always attacks men. Do, do I think that not enough is done to help women? Absolutely. I mean the the Ashton Murphy case, the Sarah Everard case in London, all those things. Those are. There's not men walking in the street fearing to be attacked. There's definitely, you know, yeah. women do. Um, how do you address it? I don't know. But, you know, I'm not going to run around and say all men are, are evil or monsters. And what happened to me, you know, when I was a teenager, I would never even have, I'd never even entered my head to think that all, all men are like that. No, absolutely not. Um, yeah, that's good. Another thing, if you you really do in your writing stand up for the little guy, Patricia. Like you know, it's um, mm. it's uh, it's very obvious that is the the case. Like you know, um, and animals as well. I just wanted just to touch on the the evil puppy farm mm-hmm. couple. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
that was a big story close to my heart because I do love animals. Um, we, uh, this was when I worked for Sunday Life about maybe eight years ago. Um, we did an undercover investigation alongside the USPCA, which is an animal charity um, in Northern Ireland. Um, we, we, we had reports coming in that um, people were buying puppies um, off a lady in County Tyrone and the puppies were coming fully vaccinated with their vet cards and everything. And they were seriously ill and dying within like two weeks. So they had that parvo virus, which I mean, straight away, um, you know, the, the, these pups aren't being kept in family homes, like it's saying in these advertisements. So we did an undercover investigation for a year. We bought a number of dogs off this lady. They were taken straight to a vet at the, vet, the veterinary hospital in the USPCA headquarters in Uri. They were tested straight away. One of the dogs had a severely uh, traumatizing hernia um, and uh, had urine burns over its body from being urinated by, over, by other animals. The other one had, I think, lice or something I don't it was just horrendous but we were able to gather enough information about her to to actually um write a story and also she then went to court and uh, the council came in and mo removed her animals um because she was using Gumtree to put up adverts with different mobile numbers she would change her mobile number regularly she changed her name she would usually go meet people in car parks with dogs who would rarely come to her home, but she allowed us one day to come to her home. So that's where we knew she, where, where she lived. Um, and uh, it turned out actually when, when, it, when, when the council were involved that her husband was banned from keeping animals. He'd been done for cruelty to horses. And they had horses in the fit. So it was, it was actually, you know, it was, it was, and that's, that's the kind of journalism that, you know, is very important to me where you can save people from the heartache and also animals from the heartache of, um, and, and the abuse. And I remember we got into actually the sheds where she was keeping the dogs. We were able to sneak in one day and it was just horrendous. It was these wee dogs and then it was, the, it was the, obviously the mother dogs that were in the worst shape there's some of them, you know, just were lying there and their wee bellies were, were on the ground because they'd been bred that much. And um, it was just, just, it was horrible. So thank God we've, we were able to put a stop to her. But unfortunately, there's so many puppy farms still going. And I'd say during the, the pandemic, when the price of dogs went sky high, that probably escalated things a bit more. Sense. I know a scumbag who obviously won't name, but he was up in court for keeping dogs in small dirty pins, no access to drinking water. Still is his license because he carried out the necessary work by the court. You know, apparently they're now well cared for. I would severely doubt that, being honest. But mm -hmm. The analogy I would put down, I think it's hard to refute this analogy, is that is the equivalent of abusive parents giving their child a bigger bedroom and then suddenly become good parents. You know? So I'm what, sure. Ridiculous. What, what's going on? Like, how is this allowed to happen? Are animal rights protesters not up in arms about this? Or, you know, it's... What, what is there to protect animals from people like us? I don't know. But it's the point, like, the, pay up the whatever work was required was carried out. They still have the licence. Mm -hmm. So I would have huge concerns for the welfare of those animals. You yeah, know? Yeah. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's something that, what can we do, like, you know? <laughs> but, um, There's not enough being done. Yeah. So I think... To, if someone has a proven record of abusing animals, they shouldn't have the, they should have their license revoked for breeding. There should be a register. There should be a register yeah. where people are put on it and they're not allowed to. I just think, I mean, if you abuse a child, like you're you're put on a register, um, which shouldn't be any different than 
anybody else. And, you know, if, if there was concerns over a child's welfare, um, social services would be involved, whereas we don't seem to have the same thing when it comes to animals. And, and animals, you know, they can't speak for themselves. They can't. Um, and there's just some evil people out there who abuse that. Absolutely. Moving on from that, I suppose, another group of people who were really badly treated, humans this time, was the mother and baby homes in Ireland and Besbra. Mm -hmm. And you did a very in interesting interview with one of the survivors of that, Terry Harrison. Now, I sent you on a video of a song that my friend Miles Gaffney performed and wrote about mother and baby home, about a woman he knows, Joe McDermott song for the fallen mothers which kind of gives yeah. an insight of what it was like yeah. in the story like yeah. having to cut grass with paper scissors and mm -hmm. being whipped by the nuns crucifix and the rosary oh. beads like, you know and is inhumane stuff i suppose when the, when the baby has been given birth without painkillers or anything like that that was their kind of penance for committing the mortal sin of having a baby outside wedlock and yeah Call yeah. the lazy, dirty whore, you know, while you're giving birth, you know, it was just yeah. horrendous. And Terry had a, a condition actually that she's actually lucky she didn't die during labor because she had a, con a, a condition called placenta previa, which I had with my firstborn son, which required me to have a cesarean section because I could bleed to death within 10 minutes and I would be dead and so would the baby. They, she had that. Um, it's basically where the placenta blocks the baby's exit route. So it, you, you couldn't give birth properly. But whatever way, they, they put her through hours of hell, no painkillers, nothing. And she's quite lucky. To, she survived it and her baby did. But unfortunately, they took her baby off her um, and, and put, put that child into forced adoption. It's just, again, I'm just... How can human beings treat anyone like that, especially especially these godly human beings who think they're better than everybody else because they're so close to God? And you know, they talk about suffering and being kind to your neighbor, and that's what they were doing to young, vulnerable women, and then stealing their children. It's crazy. Not only stealing, but selling them. Yeah, sell the them. Bitter. and then and sh and then go, uh, the poor children that didn't make it that died um, were just chucked into a pit as if they weren't even worthy of getting their own headstone. It's they're they really they really disgust me. And I I mean, do you get so, into heaven after doing that? If you're if you're a nun or you're a priest, I'd love to know that. Absolute scum, you know. Mm -hmm. Um. As well as that, you also reported on the possible falsification of debts mm -hmm. by the institutions, um, Besbra and other institutions claiming for right. for women and children who'd already left. Yeah, that's oh. right. They um they had quite a good business going where they were um selling children to wealthy couples in America and even even telling some of these women that their babies had died and they hadn't died at all falsifying certificates and it was a real big probably it probably was one of the biggest frauds in Ireland at that time and no one knew anything about it because they believed they believed these people because they were re religious or or they said they were religious Absolute power corrupts absolutely, I suppose someone said before. Um, mm -hmm. In the Miles, the song the Miles wrote, like you said, masquerading as brides of Christ, you know, but they were far from that. They were evil, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, and um, the church has yeah. done a lot of a lot of harm, mm -hmm. a lot of harm. Yeah. But again, a lot of a lot of work went into to covering that, and obviously, it's uh, it's difficult. It's, mm -hmm. it's a difficult topic and like how did your mental health kind of cope but there's a lot, of, a lot of horror stories there like you must be hard to deal with in your, no, in, like this I, like I, I, I don't know what it is I think I'm maybe I'm able to kind of close it away 
I'm able to close it away. And of course, there's stories that affect you deeply, like, and, but it, 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 it's never affected my mental health ever. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of court reporting and I've sat through some pretty horrendous trials. Um, so I think you, I think you're just either that sort of person that can handle it or you're not. Um, so I think I'm lucky that I can handle it and I'm able to um, just put it away when I'm, when I'm away from it and not working. For yourself. No, it's good to do that because obviously we'll get you, I'd say, if you, if you let it. Yeah. Before we wrap up, as things stand, you are, you feel safe. Yeah, I do. You, I you feel, do feel safe. The threats are, are, are over. You feel able to go about your business. Um, I, I, I wouldn't. There's still areas I wouldn't go into. I just wouldn't, and I've had to go into them a couple of times, and I, and I, I don't. I, I've had to. When I say I've had to, I have no choice. Um, but I, I do. I just don't like being there. But um, no, everything's good. Everything's. I'm happy. Um, I'm probably the happiest I've been in a long time, and um, I'm just I'm I'm grateful that um, my family's healthy and I'm healthy, and that everyone around me is healthy. And um, I think my, mostly my, my thoughts are with the Ukrainian people at the moment and what they're going through because it's nearly um, yeah it mirrors a bit of what happened here and what what went on. So. I just, you know, my heart goes out to them. And that's what I'm mostly thinking about at the moment, Padraig, not myself, just those, mm. those people. Well, I hope that you get the support around you anyway, and that I hope that you have good support around you and that you'll, you'll, you will continue to have. Um, Thank you, Padraig. I really appreciate it. For anyone who wanted to get involved in journalism, despite all the mm -hmm. ups and downs you've had, would you recommend it? I, I would I would recommend it yes um, I love journalism I mean we need we need great journalists in this world it's never been more important now to have good journalists because of um, the, the disinformation on social media um, propaganda being put out from everywhere at the moment um, so it's important but I, if I could give advice to any you know journalists going into it I just um, I'd say to them to don't just focus on the print side of journalism. Try and uh, try and get a lot of multimedia skills, and in particular video, because I believe video is the future. I believe that's that's where where it's going. So, um, anybody getting into journalism, just just don't think about newspaper or magazines or just online writing. Try and build your skills. Um, as much as possible when you're you're going into it, so you're you're ready for the future. Or set up a podcast like I did, you know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and podcasts are great. What do you think the future holds? Have you any plans you'd like to, to talk about? Yes, I I will be doing my own podcast from April, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I, I'll just have a variety of guests. There's not going to be a genre. It'll just be powerful stories. Um, and it won't be like a chat show sort of thing. It will just be a focus on the subject as, most as, uh, as much as possible. So I'm really looking forward to that project because I just love sitting, talking and hearing people's stories. So, uh, it's, you know, that's what I'm, I'm, I'll be focusing on at the moment. And also um, uh, in the next few months from April, I'll be doing a wee bit of um, behind the scene, scenes film work. Uh, not in front of the camera so I'll be doing that but I'll be focusing more on that from, from April Okay, very good Brilliant, if, if I can be of any help to you with the podcast, just give me a show Absolutely, you're more than welcome to come on Podrick and I can then probe you and get deep into your psyche and talk about everything <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you are more than welcome and thank you I'm really honoured to be your first female guest thank you and, and, and you really did your research anyway Always, yeah. I really appreciate it. Where can people find you, Patricia, if they want to follow you? Uh, at the moment, people can find me on my Twitter page. That's what I'm mostly using at present until I get other things off the ground. So that's at Trish Delvin. 
Okay, very good. And I'll put the link to your website as well in the, the articles in the video description as well there, including the ones, the main ones, the ones we talked about there, because they do deserve brilliant. to be highlighted. They're brilliant Thank stuff. You. Listen, look, I suppose, as I said earlier, you are you are a woman that I have immense respect and admiration for, and your courage is, uh, you know, it's really admirable, like, you know, how you manage to stand up to bullies, that you still put yourself out there. And I hope you and your family continue to be safe and that the future will be onwards and upwards from, from, from now on. Thank you very much, Patrick. I really appreciate it. Thanks again for having me on. So guys, if you're watching on YouTube, please like, subscribe, click the notifications bell. If you're listening on audio only on Podbean or Spotify, please click follow. And please check out my vlogging channel, Pitch Spotting with Podrick. Uh, Patricia was a fan of the, the Train Spotting parody trailer I did. I absolutely <laughs> brilliant it's, i honestly go on and watch it it's one of the best uh youtube trailers i've ever i've ever seen it's brilliant fair play to you yeah i look at just a bit of fun anyway like can we'll see see where it takes us but a couple of good games so far the manchester derby a couple of weeks ago was great and you never know i might come up to derry for a, a vlog at some yeah. stage to brand you well if you do well i'll give you a shout Give me a shout, definitely, and we'll grab a pint. Which you're uh, speaking, this yeah, is your own pint. Here, it's uh, uh, the the there, you haven't done much drinking in the last hour and a half, so that's a oh, the conversation. Is good. I'm not a fan of Guinness myself either, I must say. No, so, Patricia, no. thanks a million for coming on the show this Thank morning, this, uh, this Paddy's Day afternoon. It's been great having you. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on the Parallel Padre Podcast. Good night. God bless. Thank you.